answer to this question. Uh, I'm going to share a working definition just for today's talk. Feel free to hate it, uh, but later preferably. Uh, so by show of hands, uh, who works in motion design with motion designers somehow? Okay. Okay. Uh, who works, this could be different people, same people. Who works in advertising somehow? Or advertising marketing? Okay. And then who works kind of in an interactive space, games, apps, websites, whatever. Okay. Who didn't raise their hand at all? Yeah, good. It's honest. Okay, okay that was all that was just checking in. Okay, <laughs> that's very helpful. So I'm going to use these terms more or less interchangeably, motion design, motion graphics. Uh, there are some contexts where they aren't the same thing, but we're not going to worry about that today. For me, these are both shorthand for motion graphic design, which in turn is a rearrangement of graphic design in motion. Now, there's a lot of assumptions that come with that. So let's kind of unpack the genealogy of motion design. If we look at like the DNA of motion design, you might see this. It kind of has two parents, as I said, graphic design and then you know, making stuff move, uh, animation, the art and science of making stuff move. Graphic design and animation obviously have a way more complicated genealogy than I'm showing here. The point that I'm trying to make here is that an important piece of motion design's DNA is visual communication, problem solving at some level at least. And that differentiates it from other forms of animation that you might be familiar with. You know, if you're thinking like Pixar and Disney, that's more like character-driven stuff, where they're going to use characters to, to convey some other storytelling intent. Okay, so that's motion design. That's enough for today. Now, I realize uh, this is a lot of arbitrary distinctions. I've lost some of you already. You're confused. Maybe you're angry. Maybe you're both. I hope not. Uh, I think some examples of contemporary motion design are going to get us all on the same page. And I happen to have brought some with me. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to show us is like classic motion design. There's audio in these. I'm going to talk over them. Uh, boom. Title sequences. Like this is a classic example of motion design because it's got graphic design in the form of typography and then the overall kind of composition of what's going on. In this case, there's some animation happening in the background, a CG kaleidoscopic thing. Uh, but this is really just the tip of the iceberg because you'll find motion design all over TV and news. This is a montage of the election coverage graphics from uh, last year's uh, election. I like how I hesitated, like, Trump, when was Trump? Oh. Uh, this is NBC. Uh, Block and Tackle did this in, in New York. Um, the reason this is so powerful is because motion graphics is unparalleled at distilling complex information, it grabbing the viewer's eyeball and just dragging it around the screen. So here's another broadcast package. Uh, this is directed by Jeremy Cox, who's speaking tomorrow at 5.30. Check that out. Um, this is kind of drawing on the cultural history of Europe to try to create some like social connective tissue between the games of the Euro Cup. Uh, so, you know, deepen the drama a bit. It's beautiful work. Motion design is obviously huge in advertising especially when you're trying to sell something that might require a little bit of explanation. So this ad is trying to explain how you can use MailChimp, right, the mail delivery service, with Facebook, which is not something that's immediately obvious. So motion design uses visual metaphor, playful shapes and animation, make it all feel a lot more approachable and easy to understand. But this doesn't, you don't have to do 2D flat stuff. You can do crazy photo reel CG rendering with abstract shapes to sell lamps, because why not? Uh, the web has unlocked a whole bunch of new formats for advertising and marketing. This is a launch video from Gretel for the iPhone 7, iPhone 7 Plus. I'm going to turn up the audio a little bit. So notice the, the choreography between image and sound here. So the dance between verbal, visual, and audio cues, that's a hallmark of motion design. So motion design can also be used uh, for something I call visual essays. I've dropped the audio out of this one because it's too confusing to hear us both talking. But visual essays are animations that use design-driven storytelling to educate, entertain, and often to persuade. So instead of selling email services or lamps, you're talking about selling ideas or concepts, right? Or maybe even causes. This one is explaining Marshall McLuhan's idea of the medium is the message, which is like kind of hard to understand. The web has always had kind of a tense relationship with motion design. Uh, my first timeline was Flash 3.0, back when it was like Macromedia Flash 3. Uh, it wasn't After Effects. A lot of people get into motion design through After Effects. 
But I remember a time when the rich web, as we used to call it, was where all the action was, right, for better or worse. I'm going to talk more about this later, but know that for now, the web is once again home to a lot of exciting, innovative motion design work. Of course, you know, mobile, 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 mobile. Uh, I'm kind of getting tired of hearing about mobile a little bit, just to be honest with you, but it's hugely important, obviously. Motion design has become uh, kind of an integral aspect of any successful user experience. Uh, this is the promo video for the relaunch of the Uber app, and motion design is used throughout the app to keep the, oriented, uh, keep the user oriented both within the app but also within the real world. Motion design is so important for successful mobile and just UX in general uh, that uh, Google's material design spec has a whole uh, module dedicated to motion design. One of my favorite voices kind of in this general space is Isara Willenscomer. Uh, if you guys haven't seen this article, The 12 Principles of UX in Motion, it's on Medium. It's a long read, it's a dense read, but check it out because it's the first, as far as I know, the first comprehensive like language or modular system for using motion in UX. It's really good. But motion design doesn't always have to be like on a little rectangle on a screen somewhere. It can be on the face of a building uh, or it could be on an interior space of that building. Um, so this is some work from Universal Everything in uh, the UK. And they've been working at the, at the intersection of architecture and animation and motion design for a long time, well before a lot of other people were in this space. Faces of buildings are great. How about faces of people? Sure, why not? This is a live capture of some animation that's been mapped onto dancers' faces uh, using projection mapping technology. So you can see these little white dots uh, on their faces if you look closely, and that's to help the projection mapping software kind of map there, the projector's right there, boom. Uh, it's helped the software kind of stay in sync with what's going on. Pretty amazing stuff. Toyota, they unveiled this concept car that's treating the whole car as a canvas for motion design. And some of this stuff's a little silly, but some of it's really cute. It's trying to personalize the car. Check out the interior of this car, by the way. Look at that, wow. <laughs> I hope it comes with like an EDM soundtrack and a little tray, tray full of mollies or something. Um, all right, so I'm gonna make a claim here, kind of a big claim, that motion design is to the 21st century what graphic design was to the 20th century. Ubiquitous, versatile, powerful. It's like I'm selling a truck or something. <laughs> I call it the lingua franca for visual culture. All right, with that proclamation ringing in your ears, let's get on to the predictions. And these are designed to be a little contentious, a little loosey-goosey. That's just so we can kind of, you know, think a little more about them. Um, and remember the context, I'm talking about motion design, not the universe in general. Uh, but it's worth asking why even make predictions, like what's the point in doing that? Um, I think that making predictions is uh, kind of a, a pretty sharp lens on how to look at what you're doing now, on your current practice, what's going on in the landscape. Sometimes you're stuck in a, in a rut and you don't even realize it until you start thinking about the future and you start wondering if you're pointed in the, in the right way. But most important, at least for me, making predictions is just good old-fashioned fun. All right, so the first prediction, number one, CG will eat the world. What does that mean? This is kind of a master prediction that's going to unlock some of the stuff I'm going to talk about later. So CG here, computer generated, okay? So for lay people, that's 3D. I'm not talking about stereoscopic 3D where you need glasses. I'm talking about, you know, 3D rendered images, usually, usually flat, not always. Okay, so... There are three main factors that are driving CG's growing appetite, at least as I see it. Uh, the first one is hardware-related, the second one is software-related, and the third one is what I call market forces. Now, let's, we're going to dive in these real fast because I think they're interesting, but also because it helps us understand where everything is headed. Hardware. So there's been like a giant revolution happening in the hardware space. Uh, well, for computing in general, it's obviously affecting CG. So the old, the old powerhouse of the computer, you were probably taught about in school, the central processing unit, the CPU, it's starting to share more and more of its responsibilities and tasks with the GPU, the graphics processing unit or graphical processing unit. And that's because the GPU can perform many, many more simultaneous tasks than the CPU uh, by itself. So you've got this new GPU accelerated architecture. You've probably heard that phrase before. So in the software world, especially in CG software, you've got third-party render engines like Octane, Redshift, and a few others. They're taking advantage of this, this new architecture, and they're making 
interactive rendering or live rendering or whatever their marketing, depart marketing department is calling it, they're making that the new norm for CG software. So like in this scene here on the left, that's Octane Render. It's rendering the scene on the right with physically accurate lighting, some depth of field effects. And notice that you know, as, as soon as the user manipulates the scene, it updates almost instantaneously. Now, if you haven't worked in CG before, you're probably like, okay, who cares? But trust me, this is, this is a big deal. It makes CG a lot more approachable, a lot, a lot more gratifying, faster, and just more fun for a wider range of visual thinkers than ever before. I'm going to stay on the software tip for just a minute because there's been so much progress in this space. The software has gotten a lot more powerful, but it's also gotten easier to use. That sequence on the left, that's the Genesis sequence from Star Trek II, Wrath of Khan, 1982. It's one of the earliest 100% CG sequences in a feature film. It was created by a team of computer scientists and artists who wrote thousands of lines of code over the course of like two years or something. Uh, really impressive, obviously, for the time. This thing on the right, uh, that's one dude who was doing a tutorial on his own. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, obviously, that's not a real fair comparison. But the point is that the software has gotten uh, incredibly powerful. Uh, there's also communities to help you learn that stuff. And the barrier to entry is just dropping, dropping, dropping for getting into CG. So the third factor that's contributing to this rise is across industries, there's this rising demand for cutting edge experiences that rely on some sort of CG for their presentation layer. So you've got augmented virtual and mixed realities, obviously. You've got uh, um, inst installation projects, like some of the stuff you saw outside, um, not to mention just like native apps and games and stuff for existing platforms. For all of them, CG, especially real-time CG, can be a shared tool that builds a bridge between humans and code. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this later, but I think this is a good time to make a point that computers don't create computer animation any more than a pencil creates pencil animation. What creates computer animation is the artist, so says John Lasseter, co-founder of Pixar. I'm just trying to say that, look, CG is not an aesthetic. CG is not a look. It's an ever-expanding toolkit. Now, the implications for CG's rise uh, are, are huge, and they're going to affect, affect aesthetics, but it's not an aesthetic unto itself. So in the realm of motion design, more and more animators and designers are finding courage to dive into the deep, deep waters of CG. And this is giving rise to new aesthetics that blend photoreal rendering, for instance, with 2D animation or graphic design, and reality is increasingly becoming clay, and people are learning how to sculpt with it. CG is capable of anything. Realism, sure, but also stylization. Dimensionality, of course, but also flatness. More and more designers and animators who previously just weren't interested in CG are starting to warm up to it, and they're bringing their own look to it. And by the way, this is all, this is all CG here. So, if you guys are familiar with CG, none of these textures were from texture maps. This is all procedurally generated in Modo. It was Alex Dingfelder who did this with some uh, design work from Joshua Harvey. Buck. Uh, okay, so the second prediction is kind of a counterpoint to that big monster prediction we just got through. Analog will make sense again. So before I say anything else, I'm going to show you two projects. One is an excerpt from a larger project, and then the second one is a, a kind of a standalone ad. America. If you care about your food, the environment, your children, or the future of all mankind, go here. You don't have to buy everything those big agrochemical companies are selling. <laughs> Mother <laughs> The first day nature made rocks, lava, noise second same but on the 300 billion and first life and with life there's fruit the next day brought ice and you go ooh convenient and today you did a smoothie dole keep growing i love that guy's voice Ooh, a smoothie. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> All right, so some of you see this coming already, I'm sure. But that first one, 100% CG, okay? 
It's obviously trying to look like stop motion, right? They got the reduced frame rate, the cameras are pretty well locked down or on simple paths. Uh, and they did an amazing job trying to make it look like stop motion, right? The first time I saw it, I thought, at least, at the very least, that it was blended, some kind of CG stop motion thing. All stop motion, incredible. From Buck, they never uh, cease to amaze. So the second one, of course, is the opposite. It's mostly analog techniques, in-camera tricks, uh, some stop motion photography. You'll see a computer sequence here in this making of video in just a second. That's to simulate how leaves might grow on the planet, which they used as a guide to actually do the stop motion animation. So <laughs> when I think about these two projects, back to back, I think about how they were made. This is kind of how I feel, <laughs> you know? Um, it's gotten to the point where it's like virtually impossible to distinguish between analog and CG or, or digital techniques. It's certainly impossible for my mom, and she's more representative of viewers at large than you know, any of us here in the room. So <laughs> the weird thing is that it, like, it used to be that you would choose analog techniques like you know stop motion claymation or something like that because you wanted their warmth and their imperfections to shine through in the end product right but thanks to advances in both technology and just like general craftsmanship it's gotten very very hard to discern how something was made was it cg was it handmade some blend so i've seen now advertisers sometimes they try to like use the making of piece of the process stuff they'll like put that on social media try to make it part of the campaign but that just underscores the point that I'm trying to make, which is that analog as a term and as an aesthetic has lost its meaning. Um, you know, analog techniques have been striving for digital perfection. Digital techniques have been striving for analog imperfection, and they're both winning. They're both doing a great job, which is fine. It, the work is amazing, it's breathtaking, beautiful. And, and I think as kind of a side benefit, we're setting the stage for analog, some kind of real, raw, imperfect analog to make a big comeback. Because that's the way the old pendulum works, right? Back in the old 19th century, the camera was born, right? And it brought with it this, this realism that even the most talented painters would strive their whole lives to achieve, right? So it really threw a curveball at painting, who'd been trying to achieve that realism for so long. But, you know, photography was looking at painting and thinking, well, we like painting's use of light and composition, so that informed photography. Then the painters kind of said, you know what? Let's embrace the limitations of painting and make images that photography could never make. Painters gave up the struggle for painting to be anything other than painting. So maybe analog animation techniques are poised for a similar revolution or renaissance. There are a lot of people out there working in this weird space, and they're just waiting for taste to change and market forces to catch up. All right, another prediction. This one's near and dear to my heart. As I said, my first timeline was Flash, Flash 3.0. Um, so I'm close to the web. Who remembers this? Show of hands? Yeah, oh, a lot of them went right up. OK. This is the old people. This is, uh, <laughs> this is 13 years old. I wanted, this is the 2004, I believe, portfolio site for Two Advanced Studios. It was created by Eric Jordan. Uh, I wanted to find the 2001 version because that was like such a big deal. It's hard to overstate how this and other projects like it influenced a generation of designers working on the web, and I was one of them. This was a time when like, the line between web design and motion design, which we didn't call it that back then, it was just getting blurrier and blurrier, and it was super exciting, and a lot of it was made possible by Flash. But of course, you know, the iPhone came along, bringing with it the death of Flash. Maybe it just sped up the inevitable thing. I don't know. Uh, a lot of people like celebrated, they're like dancing on the grave of Flash, but I was sad, you know. I knew that a very precious baby had just been thrown out with the bathwater. Um, you know, that this, along with this whole death of, it wasn't really just about Flash, it was about the death of the rich web, that term I used earlier. So video and animation, which was previously completely integrated into the experience. Now it's in boxes on YouTube and Vimeo and Facebook. Everybody grabbed everything and put it back in its place on the web. Pandora's box was just hammered shut. So yeah, the web has become a lot more usable, but it's become a lot less exciting too. Look, I get it. So a lot of people made bad stuff with Flash and it was riddled with you know, security holes and performance problems, whatever but it was also groundbreaking. It introduced animation and motion design to millions of people, both as creators and consumers. 
It was a rule-breaking, genre-bending, glorious tool and platform, and I don't want to forget it. Okay, so now let's say you want to do some web animation uh, and current, in the current day. Um, yeah, you better dust off your GitHub account. So <laughs> uh, web animation is, is dominated by dozens, if not hundreds, of libraries and frameworks for JavaScript and CSS and God knows what else. This is just a quick smattering of some of the popular uh, frameworks out there. There's no guarantee that these are going to do uh, what you want them to do on the platform or device that you want them to do. Uh, also, there's new ones every week, and then the, the old ones just kind of wither away and die after people stop working on them. There are some tools, growing number of tools out there that are like standalone tools, kind of like Flash, where you can work in a visual workflow. Um, these are for creating production-ready animation, ideally, not prototype animation. Um, if you use any of these, then you know that they're not really code-free in most cases. You've got to end up popping the hood, getting in there, messing around, tweak things to get it to work how you want. By the way, this is the product page for um, Tumult's Hype, which I think is in version 3.6 right now. Check out these, I'm going to use my laser pointer. Check out these key features, timelines, actions, scenes. Those were like standard fare in the early 2000s in Flash. Same terms even. So look, nothing against Tumult. They, they're doing a great job building an awesome tool, visual tool for working this way. They have to keep up with all these shifting specs and you know, platforms and stuff. It's just that we've been here before and it was all a whole hell of a lot easier. This is uh, an encouraging thing, though. There's some interesting projects out there. This is a demo for Body Movin', which is a, a library for exporting vector animation from After Effects to JavaScript, SVG, like a little JSON file. It's really cool. It's, it's for creating you know, web animation, basically. What we're seeing here is uh, an inverse kinematics arm rig from After Effects um, being rendered in real time, animated in real time. So those aren't baked keyframes. Those, that's the actual After Effects, uh, effects expression that's driving the animation. It's very cool. Body Movement was cited uh, as kind of inspiration or reference for Facebook's Keyframes project. Um, Keyframes is an open source project, kind of like Airbnb's Lottie, L-O-T-T-T-I-E, L-O-T-T-I-E, too many T's. Uh, both of them, Lottie and Keyframes, are, they allow you to work in After Effects and then bring your animation over for native iOS and Android development. Uh, Marcus Eckert has been doing this for, I think, longer uh, with Squall and some other projects he's been working on. All of this stuff, though, is not for the web, right? This is for native iOS and Android development. But it's cool that people understand that the tools that people want are the tools that allow them to use the most powerful tool in their tool belt, which for motion designers, a lot of times is After Effects. It could be a CG tool. So there's work being done here. It's encouraging. It's exciting. It's you know, not nearly as easy as it used to be, obviously, but the web is warming up to motion again, and I am super excited about it. Some people never gave up, right? They just adapted their technology. Jam 3 here in Toronto, they've been making this stuff like forever. Uh, this is a, a, a new project or a newish project from, from them, and it shows how motion design can help us reimagine that rich web that I've talked about before. Now, some people poo-poo this kind of design. You know, it doesn't fit in some, I don't know, small box of what the web is supposed to be. But that's BS. You don't want the web to be an ordered encyclopedia. I want it to be fun, exciting, and an encyclopedia. So here's an example, totally different, again, with motion design, playing with kind of just editorial design uh, to create a really fun uh, experience that communicates some real clear brand values. I think we're, there's already a lot of this stuff out there. We're going to see more and more, especially as the tools uh, make this a little easier. All right, prediction number four. You knew I was going to have to go here. Uh, motion design will be the visual markup language for augmented reality. Okay, augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality. Da, 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 da. Um, before we talk about this stuff, before we talk about motion design's role in this stuff, let's go down a rabbit hole because there's a lot of confusion about these terms and how they're used. So I'm going to use this as my kind of framework. Uh, Professor Paul Milgram proposed the reality-virtuality continuum back in 1994, like during the first wave of VR and stuff. So it's got some problems, but it's a good bird's-eye view of things. So we're going to step through it real quick because it's fun and it helps, uh, helps us talk about this stuff. So on the left-hand side is the real world, the real environment, right? Unfiltered objects, people, stuff, junk. Look at this picture. It's so depressing. Did anybody notice that I chose it? There's a, a bottle of hand sanitizer right there. Is that not funny to anybody else? Okay, so for the real environment, 
You don't need much in terms of hardware. In my case, I need some glasses, you know, just normal glasses. If we go all the way to the other end of the spectrum, to the virtual environment, this is 100% computer-generated, fully immersive stuff. There's no real world peeking through here. You're totally in a virtual world. So the demo you're looking at here is from uh, First Contact. Uh, the, you can see the user in the corner is super tiny, but he's got an Oculus Rift headset on. He's got the Oculus Touch controllers that's controlling the hands in the environment. Um, okay, so that's all the way up to the right. You guys know some of the big players in this space. They're all over the news. Uh, but there's so much going on in this space. There's you know, hardware manufacturers, startups, uh, content creators, academics. VR is here to stay this time around, okay? <laughs> I was around in the 90s. I know what failure looks like, and this isn't it. We've, 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 it's like a bicycle helmet. Yeah, look at, oh, sorry. Uh, it's crazy. Uh, whatever. Okay, so let's talk about these middle two terms. Um, this is where things get a little weird. Because we've got augmented reality, which we've all heard of, but then we have augmented virtuality. What? So together, Paul Milgram called these mixed reality, which is another one you've probably heard. But it's that term on the right. It's a little problematic. It's not really used a lot. Uh, it's hard to find compelling examples, especially in this context. So we're going we're gonna to change things a little. I'm just going to do a little whoop to do and hope you guys are OK with that. This might rub some of you the wrong way. Uh, but look, not even the tech giants who are pushing these terms agree on what they mean and how they should be used. So let's just live with it for a second. Okay, augmented reality. Um, it's the classic augmented reality here, this window on the world augmented reality, is where you have the real environment and you have information or graphics layered on top of it. I worked on this project on the left at PSYOP about four years ago. We made it in three days. The bottleneck wasn't the tech, it was the animation. <laughs> so it's not hard to do this stuff, it's been around for a while. Um, then we can move into the kind of like cool emerging hardware space. I hope you guys did the demo for HoloLens. There's other cool stuff that I think would fit in this same category out there. Uh, so in, in the kind of headset space, there's a lot of innovation happening. Um, you know, by the way, Microsoft calls this mixed reality, so <laughs> whatever. Uh, <laughs> it's fine. Mixed reality, augmented reality, it's all going to kind of get mi mixed up together. So you're seeing the same idea. You've got graphics composited onto the real world, but what makes this super compelling is that they're kind of fixed in space, right? And they can stay on a wall or a floor or a desktop or whatever. It's not perfect, obviously, the, the field of view is really narrow and there's some other problems, but it's pretty damn exciting. Of course, I, I, you know, there's, there's other people in this space, there's, uh, I haven't used this headset yet, but uh, Meta has one and Daiquiri, they're kind of like going after the commercial application space, enterprise space. Uh, have to mention Magic Leap. Uh, these guys have raised over a billion dollars in funding with Google as a lead investor, and they have yet to reveal their hardware to the public. Uh, this demo is really impressive, they say it's shot right through the technology, no compositing, no special effects. Uh, but without having seen the hardware, it just feels like too good to be true. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, all right, so why am I going on about it? Why, why am I going on to all these nuances? Well, I think it's really important, especially for motion design, that you understand these nuances, because this is going to make or break uh, kind of how you move forward. So. I think the clearest path forward for motion design is actually through augmented reality, not through virtual reality. Augmented reality is poised for faster adoption than VR, and the technological barriers to entry for motion designers is much lower. So I'm going to make this argument a little deeper here. Okay, so first we're going to go back to the right-hand side of the spectrum. Back in the virtual reality VR land, there's two kinds of VR, generally speaking, right now. You've got cinematic and interactive, or what I call true VR. So cinematic, as you guys have probably done this, um, it's, you, you put the headset on, you're looking around at a video. Uh, as you move, you know, you're looking at it. You can't touch anything, but it, these can be really uh, cool, very powerful experiences. But as cool as they are, this isn't like the real promise of VR, right? It's basically filmmaking on a sphere. Ugh, uh, it's probably going to piss some people off, but look, I'm not trying to downplay like the creative and technical challenges and making this 360 content. It's, it's hard and it's fun and very powerful stuff, but it's not really the ultimate goal of VR. Also, not a super exciting space for motion design. The ultimate goal of VR is like fully interactive words, worlds, <laughs> words, worlds rendered in real time, right? Worlds where you can pick up objects, you can move through space, you can interact with other characters or other people. So VR, real VR, requires considerably more computing power and considerably more technical expertise to pull it off. 
This is a, go, a quote from uh, Gabe Newell. He's the co-founder of Valve, and the co-developers of the HTC Vive high-end VR headset. And if you read this while I'm talking, which is probably hard, uh, you'll see he's, he's very realistic about where VR is and how far it has to go. They want more than anybody for VR to reach those science fiction levels that we all dream of. Don't get me wrong, okay, like I love VR. I'm super pumped about VR. Uh, but for motion design, diving into VR, this interactive VR, means basically building worlds from scratch. It's a lot more akin to game development than it is to contemporary motion design. And if you want to do that, that's totally cool. That's totally fine. But you got to know that you're taking on a whole new paradigm. And with that are going to come high costs of technology and expertise and just time, time to make mistakes and learn. And there's not a great deal of business out there probably for you either. So some motion design and animation studios are making a go at it. Um, Tendrils here, they made Sankara. They've done actually a lot in this space. And I salute the pioneering effort there because you have to have these people pushing the leading edge. Um, I'm just talking about motion designers in general. I think AR is, is a little like lower hanging fruit. The last week at the Facebook Developers Conference, smartphone based AR, but really just AR in general, was a big piece of their story. It was like the, the centerpiece for Mark Zuckerberg's keynote. Uh, he, the, the message he was trying to communicate was super clear. He actually said to the audience, if you take one thing away from this talk, this is what he wants you to take away. His, his point is augmented reality, it's now. It's already mainstream. It's already available. The platform of the future is in your pockets, in your purses. So for him, for Facebook, uh, augmented reality, or on our phones at least, is not only a technology platform, it's, uh, it's a marketplace. And it's also a public gathering space. This is a really cool animated art piece that's uh, mapped to the side of the Facebook building and Facebook's campus. I'd like to see this. This is apparently something you can check out now. So if somebody's seen it, I'd love to know about it. This is a great example, though, of augmented reality, of, like basically motion design as a markup layer for, for reality. And this was created by Superbright. It's a fashion show, right? So you go to the show, and every time a model comes out, you look through your phone, and you can see the, the designer, uh, where you can buy it, how much it costs. It's really smart. It's like not that complicated what they did. The LED panels on either side of the catwalk change with every model, is my understanding of it. And so those act as the triggers for the AR experience in the phone, and I think they work as tracking markers too. This is, you know, this is not super difficult. It's, it's difficult from a creative standpoint, and they did an awesome job with it. But technically, you can do this now, today. Obviously, it's happening. Uh, but for years, we've been using motion design as a market player for reality in sports and news. And the current state of the art is pretty damn sophisticated. You guys have seen these arrays of cameras, you know, at, at the stadiums. This is why. Um, a lot of what we're learning here, what we've been doing in this space, is going to apply to augmented reality on emerging platforms. So with that in mind, imagine this scenario. You're in a, like a live game at your luxury skybox because you're loaded, and you're watching the game through glass, but the glass is also a screen. So you're getting real-time updates on the players and the games as the game progresses. It's like having your own private sports channel. So... Augmented reality has reached an inflection point, and it's like the fog is lifting, and the path forward through augmented reality for the next you know, five or 10 years is becoming clearer and clearer. So you couple that with fast, widespread adoption across a range of hardware platforms, and I think we could see a gold rush of sorts for motion design into this space. Ultimately, they're all going to converge, and what we call augmented reality and virtual reality probably aren't going to make a whole lot of sense, but in the near term, it's interesting to look at the space for motion design. Okay, so I just threw a whole bunch of stuff at you. Um, you've been getting a bunch of stuff thrown at you for the last day and also tomorrow. So I want to give you some advice that I've learned a lot the hard way on my own and also working for a lot of different companies about this, uh, on this stuff. Um, when you're here, you I hope you're feeling like this because this is how I usually feel, right? But <laughs> the kid's in it. But then... A couple days later, three days later, you're going to go home, and <laughs> yeah, you get a little overwhelmed, but it's usually the plane ride back starts to hit me, get a little depressed. <laughs> so, uh, poor Ben. Uh, so I'm going to give you some advice, this is first for individuals, then for businesses, about what to do. The first one is the hardest one, and it's the most important one. 
You got to be honest and play to your strengths. So often we learn about a new thing and we just go running after it as fast as we can because learning new things is fun. Every Hello World application that you write in some new framework or new animation you make in a new tool feels great. It's a dopamine hit. But then, you know, you realize you're just chasing new stuff all the time. You're going around in circles. It feels like you're going up, but you're actually going down. And it's exhausting. Uh, so look, being interested in something isn't good enough. It has to fit in your existing network of skills and interests, which is why when I need to make a big change in my life, I create something called an interest skills map. Uh, this is a greatly simplified version. Usually it's a lot bigger and all that, but it takes me a couple hours to do this. But so for me, so the size of the circle, that's how interested I am in it. The color is my skill level or confidence level in it. So green is high, red is low. And then the proximity of the circles to each other is how closely related I feel those topics are to each other. So this is a great way to get an impressionistic sense of your professional or creative landscape. It helps you see maybe you're spread too thin or maybe you're overinvested in one area. And as you want to learn something new, you can plug it in. To the, and if it doesn't plug in very well, if you're like, oh, I want to learn, uh, I want to learn artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, if you're being honest with yourself, artificial intelligence is off the screen over there by the guy with the camera. That's not something I should probably uh, be worried about right now. So obviously when you're learning anything new, you guys know this because you're here, but you make a project with that thing, but you got to make the smallest project possible. The problem is that when you're learning, you don't know how much you don't know. So as you start the project, it starts to get bigger and bigger, and you realize, shit, this isn't small at all. This is actually pretty big, which is why number three is really important. No smaller, because when you hit that wall, and you will hit that wall where you realize, oh, this is actually bigger than I thought, that's an opportunity. You should stop, back up, and shrink your project. Shrink it either by breaking it into smaller parts or just start over with a smaller goal. There's nothing wrong with starting over. It takes time and experience to understand what small means, so give yourself the permission to do it. Now, this is obvious, and I'm preaching to the choir, but always be learning. More specifically, these days, always be enrolled in something. There's so many classes. I'm taking a coding boot camp class for three months this summer. I'm terrified. I have a wife and a kid. I don't know what I'm doing, but it's important for me to always be taking something. You can, online, there's every amount of, you know, hours and, and uh, you know, energy that you have. You can find something. There's really no excuse. But the big key is that when you enroll in these classes, go in there, in, like, enrolling to become a student, not a master, right? Like, enroll knowing that you're not going to come out of there ready to, like, take over the world. Enroll knowing that it's more important to understand than it is to command at first, okay? That, that should help you chill out a little bit. I think a lot of times people don't take on classes because they feel like they have to emerge like a ninja or something. It's, that's ridiculous. Just get over that. Okay, so business stuff. From the business perspective, what do you do? The number one thing here, I think, to understand, because I've worked at a lot of places that didn't seem to have a very, very good grasp on this, is that nimbleness is inversely proportional to size. And what I mean by nimbleness is the ability and the desire to change, to change as an organization. I mean, without nimbleness, every business would die eventually, right? You have to respond to the changing marketplace, and it's always changing. So the bigger the team, the harder it is to stay nimble. So what's the obvious, uh, what do you do? You keep your team small. So even big organizations can create small teams that act as change agents within their organization. And the key is you got to give them freedom. you got to let them fail. If possible, detach them from the normal chain of command at the organization so they can be as autonomous as possible. Now, you yeah, you have to give them budgets and deadlines and constraints. I mean, those are necessary ingredients for innovation. But you want to make these teams feel sovereign. You want to make them have a sense of identity. It's really important. So <laughs> this says, understand what investing in change means. I've worked at so many places that are like, we are investing in the future. We, you know, whatever that means. So let's break down what it means, because it's actually, it's, it's harder to swallow than it might sound. So the first thing is what most people get excited about is investing in technology. New toys. Everybody loves this. This is great. But if you really want to tap the full potential of the technology that you're investing in, you're going to need to invest in people, right? Either by training the people you have or by hiring some new people so they can bring their expertise to play. And that means that you also have to invest in failures. And this is the part that I don't hear talked about enough. You have to invest knowing that you're going to lose money, basically, at least in the short term. The upshot 
is that you will hopefully add some new capabilities to your studio and some new offerings. And then a side benefit of that is that retention should go up since creative people like us, we like to work at places that understand change and how to invest in it. All right, the last or the third one here, play to your strengths and focus. This is kind of a variation on the interest uh, skills thing for the individuals. That actually works well for organizations too. You gotta do a little tweak though. You get three, or three to five people or so at your organization who've been there long enough that they understand the organization, put them in a room, give them a couple hours, have them build one of these maps for the organization and listen to them as they build it. You should be able to figure out kind of where your, your opportunities are and where you can go. Um, it's just that when you're done with that, pick one direction to go. Don't pick two or three things you want to pursue as a company. Pick one. Because if you pick one and it doesn't work out, you can say, well, it was the wrong direction. It's not because you were trying to go two places at once. So look, we, all of us, are positioned really well for the future in this room. We're curious, we're smart, I think, and we're creative. Uh, so it's going to be awesome. <laughs> okay, Let's try to stay pumped. Um, with that, I'm out. Thank you guys so much. Thank <clears throat> you.